in Daniel chapter 6, when you're on the lion's menu, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to read a pretty good portion, just down to verse 17, standing in honor of the reading of God's word. I read tonight from the King James text that pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it shall not be changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Nothing changed. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth thee not, O king, for nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. Then there's something. He wasn't displeased with Daniel. He was displeased with himself. And he set his heart on Daniel to what? To deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions, now the king spake and said unto Daniel, listen to this, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Master, we thank you, God, tonight for your word. We thank you, God, for this word of exhortation you've placed in my spirit. Help me, God, now to deliver it in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your name. Encourage the hearts of every hearer. Let everyone, God, tonight 
that would hear this message, understand that when the enemy would come against them like a flood, that you will indeed raise up a standard against them. God, no harm shall come to us if we'll walk faithfully and consistently in your sight. Master, today let this word break forth in our spirit like a well of living water, bringing new life to our spiritual being. Grant it tonight, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated tonight, and amen. Here was Daniel, someone who was a slave to a nation that he didn't belong to. He didn't belong there, but he was there. And even in spite of his condition, even in spite of his situation, God blessed him in such a way that he became one of the greatest men in the entire kingdom. I try to tell people, if you'll just serve God and do God right, God will do you right. And whether you're in a situation where you want to be or whether you're in a situation that you like being in or whether you're in a situation that uh, you're miserable about, God will cause you to be favored in whatever situation you're in. Amen. God will cause favor to shine down upon you everywhere you go, everything you do. And all you have to do to achieve that divine favor is Walk faithfully before the Lord. That's all you got to do, mother, is be faithful. People don't realize that they would just be faithful. God would shower them with blessings. I'm going to tell you, this Word of God that we preach from and this Bible that we read from, this is a love letter from heaven to earth. It's the, be it's the best, most wonderful love story that you're ever going to read in your entire life. And I'm going to tell you, when God lavishes gifts, Upon his beloved, he knows how to lavish. Amen. It wasn't just a matter of sending some few flowers or bringing a few balloons. See, that's what we do when we want to lavish gifts on somebody. You know, a little gold, a little silver, a little... Some balloons, some flowers, that's how we lavish gifts. But you know what? When God wants to lavish gifts on people... He knows how to take a slave and make him the number one man in the entire kingdom, second only to the king. Amen. Now that's a gift, isn't it? <laughs> he was like, well, how can I do well at work? How can I do well in my life? How can I do well in this situation or in that situation? I'll tell you how. You want to do well in, in your home situation, you got a landlord that's a weenie and you're, you don't really like him too well and you don't like having to deal with him, then just be the best tenant you can be. Come on now. And while you're at it, be the best Christian you can be. Come on now. And see if God doesn't give you favor with that Oscar Mayer weenie. Amen. Amen. How can I excel at my workplace? It's easy. Two things. Be the best employee you can be and be the best Christian you can be and see if God doesn't put you in divine favor. See if God doesn't put you in line for promotions when everybody else is sitting back on their laurels, lazing off and doing nothing and getting nowhere fast. That's how it works. Daniel, the greatest thing Daniel had going for him was his relationship with God. The greatest thing Daniel had going for him was his relationship with the Lord. It was the most consistent thing. And when his enemies wanted to lay a trap for him, they knew that there was not going to be an area that they would find that they could possibly lay a trap for him. The only thing they could possibly do would be find some way, somehow, to trap him by reason of his consistency right. with his relationship with God. Right. Right. I tell you what, Tommy, you got you got quite a life going when people want to do you dirty and they can't find a way. Right. Because the only way they can find to do you dirty is say, well, the only thing I know he does every day or every week is go to church on Sunday. The only thing I know he does is pay his tithes. The only thing I know he does is pray. The only thing I know or she does is this or that. You see what I'm saying? You you got a pretty good life when that's the only pro that's the only area somebody can find in your life where they might even begin to trip you. 
If I want to run him off the road, you know what? I'm not going to be able to run him off the road uh, before he goes to work or coming home from work because he never goes to work and comes home from work at the same time every day. But boy, I'll tell you what, you can look for that fool on the highway at 8.30 every Sunday morning because he's headed for church. He may not get to work on time, but he sure does get to church on time. You hear what I'm saying? This guy, he may not have the most perfect credit in the world. He may have been stumbled and fell a few times in his life and didn't quite have the money to pay some bills. But you know what? She writes her check for that tithe. I can't find any fault in her financial conduct, but I'll tell you what, the only thing I know for a fact she does consistently is tithe. Sometimes your consistency in your service to the Lord is going to be the only weakness that people can find in you. And that's a pretty glorious weakness to have, isn't it? Amen. And Daniel was found to be above reproach, and there was no way that the law that Darius had signed into, the decree that he had signed, there was no way that this decree was going to fail to trap Daniel, because Daniel's consistency could be counted on. And I love what the Word of God tells us in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, in other words, Daniel was well aware. He was standing there before Darius when all these princes and all these captains came in and said, this is what we've decided to do, O king. Daniel was top dog. He was the number one man. He was standing right there. He was hearing it. He was watching it. And as soon as they finished saying what they had to say, and the king signed the paper, Daniel said, all right, folks, I'll see you all later. I've got to go pray. Amen. I don't care what you signed. I'm going to do what I did beforehand. I'm going to do it the same way now that I did it then. Because my faith hasn't changed. My convictions haven't changed. My dedication hasn't changed. I'm going to be the same man that I was beforehand. I'm not hurting Darius, and I know I'm not hurting Darius. If Darius takes offense at it, well, that's between him and God. Oh, but Daniel, didn't you hear what the punishment would be? You're going to be put on the lion's menu. See, Daniel had enough sense. That's what I love about people who don't stand up for God for nothing. Daniel had enough sense to understand something. He could turn around and look at him and say, Honey, I'm on the lion's menu every day. That's right. That's right. Amen. Do you hear me now? I'm on the lion's menu every day. I was born on the lion's menu. I was born a Hebrew child. I was born on the lion's menu. I was born a son of a, son of a Jew. I was born on the lion's menu. Honey, I've been on the lion's menu since day one. The minute you pray through to the Holy Ghost, the minute you become a blood-bought child of God, honey, you're on the lion's menu. So just because a threat comes down the pipe, that sounds like it's going to be a greater obstacle or a greater a tragedy you might have to endure. Guess what? Don't worry about it. Don't fret it. Because you've been on the lion's menu the whole time. Amen. But they're threatening to put me on the menu for the lion. But Brother Barr, you don't understand because if this happens, then, you know, this is going to happen to me. Stand up, you lily livered jellyfish, no backbone. Stand up and stand up for God. Do what you did the same way you did it beforehand. I can't stand people in today's world who don't stand up for God. Boy, if there's anything I believe with all my heart that disgusts the Lord in the year 2005, it is the absolute lack of commitment, the absolute lack of conviction that is found in the people of God. Oh, everybody wants to go to the mega church. Everybody wants to go to T.D. Jakes. Everybody wants to go to J. Don George's. Everybody wants to go to these big old churches. I've got a cousin that I love dearly, but he and his wife, they're always looking for a mega church they can go to. Every community they move to, they wind up in a mega church. Right here in Texas. 
because you can be entertained there. Oh, every Sunday they're going to have some superstar, some special person going to be there to sing for me. Yes, and every Sunday when Mary J. Blige leaves the church house, she doesn't know who you are any more than when she came. If you think you're going to have an opportunity to shake her hand or hug her neck or kiss her face, i got news for you. No, they're going to usher her off the stage the same way they do at the concert hall. Because, honey, if she's going to come in as an entertainer, she's going to go out and entertain her. If she's going to come in as a child of God who wants to be fed, then she's going to be treated like a child of God who wants to be fed. My Lord, have mercy. Am I telling the truth? Amen. I love these people who go to these big mega churches. <laughs> well, Pete Diddy was at our church last Sunday. Pete Diddy. So what you're telling me is Padidi was there. And I suppose that after church, y'all went out to fellowship, and y'all sat down at Denny's, and y'all had a meal together, and you enjoyed this company, and it was just one of, oh, no. Oh, why didn't you? Well, you know, after, after the service, they kind of ushered him out, and we really didn't see where he went or how he went or what, you know. My kids said that they think they thought they saw the car that he might have possibly been riding, you know. My Lord, you're kidding me. They might have seen the car that he possibly was riding in. Oh, great Jesus, I just got a bolt from the Holy Ghost. Bunch of idiots. But you see, we're in a society where people, people don't want to be in a place that reminds them of boot camp. Because that's what church is. The purpose of church is to help prepare you and train you to deal with warfare. Because every day of your life, you're in a battle. You're on the lion's menu. The purpose of church, Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. That's the first priority of God's church. Preach the word. Why? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Preach the word. That's the first priority of God's church. Not entertain. Come on now. Not entertain. That's not God's church's first priority. But you know, sing songs the way I like to sing them. I'll tell you what, as long as the word's all right, I could care less what the songs are like. Amen. As long as my soul can be fed when that preacher starts to open his mouth, I could give a care what the choir sounds like or whether the sister so-and-so got a beautiful voice or sounds like a squawk of chicken. It doesn't matter to me. That's one thing I love about old-time Pentecost. You know, I know some folks, and I'm not going to name names, but you all probably know what I'm talking about. I know some folks don't altogether sound like country western singers when they get up to sing. But one of the wonderful things about old-time Pentecost is it's never about the polish. It's never about the how perfect you can do it. It's never about whether or not you can hit every note perfectly on tone. It's about whether or not you've got an experience behind the song that makes you sing the song with conviction so that the people in the pew can feel, not hear, feel what you're singing. Amen. That's old-time Pentecost. So old Sister Schmelzer gets up there and squawks like a hawk. That's all right. As long as Sister Schmelzer's squawking, it's coming from a place in her heart of experience. And as long as in the process of her squawking, she can convey that experience to you and I. But you know, we're in a place now where the church is lacking in conviction and we're lacking in people who stand up for God. And, you know, we got preachers out there telling people they need to stand up for God in areas that are so foolish and so stupid. Yes, amen. You don't stand up for God by standing against homosexuals. You don't stand up for God by standing against 
the ACLU. You don't stand up for God by standing against this one or standing against that one. It's called stand up for. Stand up for. Let me help you understand how that works. That means you're standing for something, not against something. Amen. See, Daniel was not acting in opposition to the decree. That's right, If Daniel never prayed a day in his life and the decree was made and all of a sudden he turned around and said, well, you know what, I'm just going to pray because I just think that's stupid. That would have been him acting in opposition to what the decree had said. But you see, Daniel was consistent on this side of the decree. He said, this is how I live my life before the decree was made. Take a wild turkey guess how I'm going to live my life after the decree was made. You hear me now? I'm going to live it the same way I lived it before. So Daniel was not acting in opposition. He wasn't standing against anything. He was just standing for something. He said, no, I'm going to do things where I've already, I've already said them. That offends you, I'm sorry. If that puts me in the lines, then, well, so be it. Because I'll tell you what, I've looked down the mouth of a lion or two in my life. And I've got news for you. I've, I've look, if I can look down a few lions' mouths and still be here to tell you about it, then that ought to tell you something. Amen. I looked down a few lions' mouths. Five years ago, I looked down a lion's mouth. And I wasn't sure it wasn't going to take my life. I wasn't sure I wasn't going to die. I wasn't sure for a while there. I told Mom, if I, I don't know if I'm going to see my 35th birthday or not. Because I was looking down the lion's mouth. But you know what, Tommy? That wasn't the first time I'd ever seen a lion's tonsils. Amen. That wasn't the first time I'd ever seen a lion's teeth. That wasn't the first time I'd ever seen the inside of the lion's throat. Now I've been there before, but I won every time. <laughs> I came out the victor every single time. Every single time. All I did was look and then turn around, walk away, and I was fine. So you know what that means to me, Mother? That means to me that if they threaten me with lions today, it's no big deal. I've been on the menu for years. I've been there before. I've seen it before. I've always come up the winner. And Daniel knew that. So Daniel was able to say, hey, lions, huh, I've faced them before. Oh, they might have looked different. They might have smelled different. They might have acted different. But you know what? They were all wanting to tear me up. They were all wanting to destroy my soul. They all wanted to, to destroy me from one, tear me from one limb to the other. But every single time I've ever faced a lion, I've always come out the winner. So why should I think that it would be any different now? See, people that are faithful to the house of God, people that go to church not to be entertained but to be fed, you know what? Those are people of faith. I love Riverside Church of God. Why do I love Riverside Church of God? Because Brother Gillum used to preach the word as he knew it. And honey, those were people of faith. Somebody come into the church and says, I'm facing a lion. Well, what's your lion, Sister Prince? What's your lion? I've got breast cancer. They want to do a double mastectomy. I've got a lion staring me in the eyes, and I can see its tonsils, and it scares me. And those people of faith, and I'm just covered right now, <laughs> those people of faith in that church look at her and say, let's go to the altar and pray it through. Because, sister, you faced lions before, and you always come out the winner, and you're facing a lion today, and you're going to come out the winner. And before they were done, Barbara Prince had been prayed through to a miracle. That lady got her miracle, went back to the doctor. They couldn't find a thing. Couldn't find nothing. Here they were scheduling her for surgery for a double mastectomy, and they couldn't find nothing. Doctor said, there's not even scar tissue. There's not even any indication that anything was there. Never mind that, <laughs> that there's something there now. It says, you know, sweetheart, I won't tell you. 
when you learn to be faithful and consistent in the service of our King, then you're going to find out in short order that, like I said, number one, God's going to give you divine favor in your life and in your situations. But number two, you're going to find out there ain't a demon in hell or a lion on earth can tear you up. Come on now, if you're faithful. Even King Darius knew. This is what I love. Even the unsaved, even the heathen, even those that don't serve God, they got enough sense in their head to know what's what. Because Darius looked at Daniel. He knew that he had backed himself into a corner. He was so upset with himself, not with Daniel, but with himself. He never one time said, Daniel, why in the world did you have to pray with your windows open? Why did you have to do that? You know, you could have left the shutters closed this time and just prayed that nobody would have known. But Darius didn't expect Daniel to compromise. Come on now. Darius didn't expect Daniel to be any different than Daniel was. Amen. So instead of being disappointed with Daniel... Darius was disappointed with Darius. And then when he knew he'd been backed into a corner and Daniel was brought to be delivered into the lion's den, you know the story. The Bible says that old King Darius looked at Daniel and said to him, Daniel, the God that thou servest continually, he will deliver you. Right, amen. <laughs> Even the king even the king, the Medes and Persians, didn't worship the God of Israel. That's right. But you know what? Even the king knew that God's relationship with Daniel was going to spare his life. I'm going to tell you, you live right and you do what you're supposed to do and you serve God faithfully and consistently. And I'm going to tell you what, when the greatest potential harm in the world comes your way, you're going to see sinners and unbelievers turning to you and saying to you, you know what? Your God will not let you down. That's right. That's right. Amen. Do you hear me now? Your God will not let you down. Oh, my God, what a testimony. When you have unsaved, ungodly, unbelieving people around you, and they're turning to you in your darkest hour and saying to you, your God will not fail you. My Lord, have mercy. Oh, man, I'll tell you, I want to shout right about now. Mm. It's like God can take the mouth of a demon and make it bless you. God can make the mouth of your enemy bless you. God can take the mouth of your neighbor that curses you all day and all night, and he can force that mouth to bless you because of your consistency, because of your faithfulness, because of your testimony. It's not anything God does. It's what you've done. I had a lady say to me one time years ago in Canton, Texas, she worked at a little convenience store over there on the corner. I love their hot dogs. They used to have the best all-beef hot dogs. Oh, I used to love those hot dogs. And I'd go in there, you know, because I lived just up the street, not even two blocks, I guess you'd call it. And I used to walk down there a lot, you know, or drive, and I'd have a hot dog or two. I'd sit there and visit with her. And while I was sitting there many, many times, somebody come in the store, they'd have tears in their eyes or something, and I'd say, well, honey, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going through a bad divorce right now, and my husband, he's beat on me and this and that, and, that. and I'd say, well, sweetie, sit with me. Come sit with me. Talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. And I'd start talking to that person about their situation and encouraging them and helping them. Or here come a child even that would come in. Maybe their knee be bruised up and they'd be kind of crying about it. And I'd say, sweetie, come here. I said, let, let Brother Mars see what's up. Let me see. I said, it can't be that bad. Let me see. You all know how much I love kids. But I sat there in that, in that place so many times, so many days, so many days. And God just put one opportunity after another in front of me to try to minister to people. And you know what? That little lady behind the counter never missed a trick. She saw every single time. And you better believe that half the time her little ear just 
started perking up and she's kind of listening to what I might have to say. And one day that lady said to me, Charles, she said, I'm going to tell you the honest God truth. She said, you are the most Christian person I've ever seen in my entire life. That's what she told me. She said, you're the most Christian. She said, I have never seen anybody in my life. She said, your whole life is about giving. She said, I watch you when you come in here. She said, most people come in to eat and all that, but they ain't even paying attention to everybody else. They don't even care if somebody's got tears in their eyes. They don't even care if a couple's fighting and they need possibly some counseling to help them work out their problems before they kill each other. She said, you know, they don't even care. They don't even pay attention. She said, I know pastors that live in this town, and people have been standing right behind them <clears throat> with the same tears and the same hurts and the same situation and the same problems, and those pastors have turned around, looked at them, and they've just turned and walked away. Mm, reminds me of the story of the Good Samaritan, don't it? Amen. She said, but you never one time. She said, it's like the minute you see hurt, you've got to do something. She said, the minute you see pain, you've got to respond. The minute you see somebody struggling with something, you want to help them. She said, I've never seen anything like in my life. She said, I was raised in the Baptist church, and I have never seen anything like you in my entire life. All right, Brother Mar, what are you doing? Tooting your own horn? No, I'm not tooting my own horn. What I'm trying to tell you today is... Your consistency and your faithfulness, your convictions are going to shine like the sun. And even the unbeliever, even somebody outside of your faith, even somebody outside of your way is going to see that in you. And there's no way they're going to be able to deny that you've got something with God. I can't tell my family that I'm in this way because it would create problems. I can't tell this one that. I can't say this and I can't. Sweetheart, you don't have to say a word. If you're living it right, they ain't going to help but notice. Amen. Do you hear me now? If you're living this thing right, they ain't going to help but notice. But you tell me, why is it every time I call you on Sunday, you're never home? What are you doing on Sunday every Sunday? Mm -hmm. See, somehow or another, after a while, it catches up with you. After a while, people start asking, you know, well, what's going on? I, I tried to call you on about 20 or 30 Sundays, and I never can seem to get you. Where are you on Sunday? You say, well, I can't tell my mama that I'm in church. That's all right. Mama will know. You bet your mama will know, because she's going to see it. It's an old song we used to sing, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. When you get Jesus on the inside, working on the outside, honey, I'm going to tell you, after a while, they quit seeing Tommy, they quit seeing Donna, they quit seeing Charles, and they start seeing Jesus. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Daniel was finally delivered into the de into the, the den of lions, as you know the story, King Darius having said to him, the God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And they sealed up that lion's den. You know, my Bible tells us from that point that Darius spent the entire night fasting. He couldn't eat. He was so concerned about Daniel. That's what a great place God had given him in Daniel's, in King Darius' heart. That, day, that Darius just couldn't even sleep. He was so disturbed over having thrown Daniel into that lion's den. And the Bible said, for that matter, he would not have any music brought before him. He didn't want anybody to try to cheer him up. He didn't want anybody to try to make him feel better. He didn't like what he'd done. He took a good guy and put him in a bad situation, and he didn't like it. My Bible tells me that first thing in the morning, when Daniel should have been well, half passed through the digestive tract of that pack of lions. Darius ran to that old lion's den and told the keeper, hey, push that stone back. And they pulled that stone away. Hmm. Make you think of a, another story? 
push that old stone away. And then there's Darius. Darius must have been a pretty crazy man because he yells into that lion thing. Daniel! Is the God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee? <laughs> and all of a sudden you hear a voice from the midst of the lion's den. A little bit muffled because Daniel's got some of that mane in his mouth, you know. He's using one of them big old males as a pillow. <laughs> yeah, King Darius lived forever. I'm fine. I'm doing all right. My God have shut the mouth of the lions. Glory to God. They have done me no harm. And Darius says, whoop -de -doo. Now I can take him out of there. We have a double jeopardy law in this country. He's done his time. If the lions didn't eat him, then he's okay. He's good to go. Take him out. Now all you idiots that were so hell-bent on getting him in there, you're going in. But they didn't have the same experience with God that Daniel had. Because as soon as they went in, the Bible says, the lions begin to tear them limb from limb. <sighs> so Daniel said, My God, whom I service continually, he hath shut the lion's mouth. But Tommy, he don't shut it for everybody. He shuts it for his own. <laughs> As soon as Daniel was out of that den, those lions could eat again. You know what? They must have been starving because they hadn't eaten. <laughs> Daniel was on the menu for supper, but they decided they didn't want him. And all of a sudden, all these kings, these princes, and all these captains who had wanted Daniel in that situation so bad that they rigged up this little trick to get him in there. All of a sudden, they're the ones who found themselves looking down the lion's throat. They're the ones who found themselves on the lion's menu. I'm going to tell you right now, God can take you off the menu and put your enemies on it. You hear me now? God can take you off the menu, off the lion's menu, and put your enemies on it. I love when people act against God's people and they think they're going to do so without retribution, like they're not going to have to pay for their actions. We didn't do a soul in this world dirty when we tried to rent that building on Ross Avenue. All we were trying to do was good, solid business, the way business should be done. And Mr. Rosansky, no, sir, he wanted to be a sneaky little skunk and try to play tricks, and I knew what he was up to, and I wasn't going to go for it. And we wound up going through... A hideous situation, but you know what, Tommy? That situation wasn't half as hideous for us as it is for him. Yes. Uh -huh. Amen. We didn't lose nothing. Monetarily, we didn't lose anything. Because if you look at it in all reality, first of all, we only paid the deposit. We were there for almost two months. So we paid $700 a month for two months is what we did. And Mr. Wazanski has lost almost $1,500 a month for almost two years already, that building, sitting empty. Because when you come against God's people, i got news for you. He'll close the mouth of the lion for his people. But the minute his people are out of the situation, he opens their mouths right back up again. And all of a sudden, your enemies find themselves on the lion's menu. And Mr. Wazanski found out in a hurry that all of a sudden he's got a property that's a big old pariah. It's a big old uh, white elephant. He can't do nothing with it. That's right. All these months, two years nearly, it'll be two years in February, and we would have been paying rent this whole time. But you know what? He kissed off $18,000 a year, almost $36,000, and how much did we lose? Not a die because God knows how to shut the mouth of the lion but he also knows how to take you off the menu and put your enemies on it I've had situations in my life where people tried to do me very dirty very dirty nasty dirty 
And God just took me off the menu and put them on it. And all of a sudden, they found themselves in a far worse predicament than what they thought they were going to put me in. You hear me now? I'm telling the truth. The Lord is able to do this. I want you to know today, there's not a situation in this world, I don't care if it's sickness, if it's disease, I don't care if the doctors have given us a diagnosis of, of doom and peril, there's not a situation in this world that God is not able to shut the lion's mouth. There's not a situation in this world that God is not able to take us off the menu and put our enemies on it. Amen. There's not a situation in this world where if we will just be faithful and consistent that God won't place us in such a high place of favor with people. And we go into restaurants and people are so kind to us and give us discounts that we never ask for. And do they do it once? No. Do they do it twice? No. Do they do it 50 times? No. Do they do it 100 times? No. How many times have they done it? I can't even count. Am I right, Tommy? Why? Because if you live this thing right, God will give you favor. He'll give you favor with people that, that you don't even realize you need favor with. But you know what? When you're running on broke and you're hungry and you don't want to take, you're too tired to mess with cooking, what a blessing to be able to run down to furs and get dinner for two for eight bucks. You understand what I'm saying? See, God knows how to take care of his own. Amen. Amen. Well, when you're, when you're on the lion's menu, do not be discouraged. You've been there the whole time. <laughs> you hear me? Don't get discouraged when you're on the, when you're on the lion's menu. Don't get upset. You've been there the whole time. <laughs>